Assalamu alaikum and welcome to In Book Daily, a short Q&A series in which we'll be exploring some pressing questions surrounding Islam. Today we'll be talking to Ustada Sidra Naeem, Anima of Havering Islamic and Cultural Centre. Assalamu alaikum Sidra Naeem, are you alright? Wa alaikum assalam, alhamdulillah and jazakallah khair for inviting me to this very important question and answer session. Um, just to let you know a little bit more about myself, I'm a qualified teacher and alima, and I've been teaching children and teenagers in madrasas, mosques and Islamic schools and Islamic centres since 2003. I also visit approximately 120 state primary and secondary schools per year, where I deliver assemblies, classroom lessons, workshops on Islam, to non-Muslim pupils. Hence, I have a lot of experience in answering many questions on all topics related to Islam. Lovely, thank you for that introduction. Um, today, we, we, we will be going through some questions from young youth, students, young people in general regarding Ramadan. Um, and so if you could kindly share your presentation and then we can go through some of those questions. Lovely. So our first question regarding Ramadan is how should Muslims prepare for Ramadan? OK, so Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to prepare for Ramadan in the month before Ramadan, which is Shaban. So the Sunnah is actually to prepare by fasting. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to fast the most in Shaban in comparison to any of the other months apart from Ramadan in order for training for Ramadan. So if you think of exercise, before we exercise, we always have a little warm up. We never ever go into exercising before warming up because then it's too strenuous. So fasting and having a little bit of um, practice before the actual month starts makes it actually much, much more easier. The other thing that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us to do was to make up for any fast that we may have missed in the previous year in that month before Ramadan. And that is an excellent way to not just get ready for Ramadan, but also to have practice and at the same time make up our first fast which we may have missed in the previous Ramadan. So we're not only just fulfilling our first fast, it's also training for the month that is yet to come. So that is what we should do. Um, and it's the best way to prepare. Lovely. So in short, just to uh, practice the previous month um, by maybe fasting a few days a week. Would, would that be your better advice? Yes. Like the Monday, Monday the and Thursdays. Mondays and Thursdays is the two Sunnah days when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu used to fast. So if we can't manage more than two days, we could just do the Monday and the Thursday, which is yeah. great. Or maybe the three middle uh, days where there is a full moon, um, yeah. 13th, 14th, 15th. That's also a very good way of practicing as well. Lovely. Thank you for that. So the second question that we've had is what is the purpose of Ramadan? So why are we fasting during this month? OK, so. The Quran was actually revealed in the month of Ramadan, which means it's an extra holy month. And that is a month in which we are supposed to do really good deeds to get closer to Allah. Now, in the times before Islam came, the rich were really, really rich and the poor were really, really poor. None of the rich were bothering to give any of their money to the poor. And one of the reasons was that they had been rich for so long, they didn't even know what it felt like to be poor. And because of that, they had absolutely no empathy towards the poor and hence then didn't help them. So fasting was actually reintroduced like it was there in the previous nations as a way of getting closer to Allah. So in the Quran, it actually tells you, oh, you who believe, fasting is prescribed for you as it was pres prescribed for those before you. 
so that you may learn self-restraint. That is actually in Surah Bakra, verse 183. And the self-restraint is the taqwa. And it's really, really interesting. But by fasting, it makes you get closer to Allah and closer to the humble people and the poor people. And then you can then gain taqwa. In the Quran, it tells you that, O oh, you who believe, fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed before you, so you may learn self-restraint. Okay, now self-restraint is taqwa. Taqwa has lots and lots of meanings. And one way you can learn self-restraint is actually through fasting in the month of Ramadan. Lovely. Well, that actually leads us on to our next question, which is surrounding taqwa. Um, and how it can be achieved. So fasting, like I explained to you, is to increase taqwa, and taqwa has many, many meanings. Taqwa is basically getting closer to Allah. It also acts like a shield, as a protective barrier between yourself and Allah's punishment. So it is actually a shield against hellfire. Taqwa also means doing that which Allah has enjoined, and avoiding that which he has forbidden. So did you know that when you fast, you feel how the poor feel, that then makes you humble, and the humbleness makes you closer to Allah. Also, if you think about Salah, when we do Sajda, that is the position when we are totally humble in front of Allah, and that is also the position when we are the closest to Allah as well. So by getting then closer to Allah, we are then protecting ourselves from shaitan as well, and hence doing anything bad. So it's a whole package of things. So it's really, really interesting how fasting makes you get closer to Allah and more humble. And when you look around the world, and you look at the most poorest of people, they are usually the most religious. Because it's the poor people that don't have ev any everything and then, then turn to Allah for things that they need, like food, shelter and clothing. Whereas the richer you are, you don't even need to remember Allah because you've got everything already. And if you look around the world, generally, the poorest people are usually the most religious. And Prophet Muhammad wasalam, told us, that the poor people will enter paradise first. So when we fast, it makes us humble, it connects us more to the poor, and that then in turn makes us closer to Allah. And when we get closer to Allah, that then protects us from shaitan, and yeah. hence doing bad. So it's a whole package of how we can attain taqwa in this month of Ramadan. So it's almost like a knock-on effect. So you fast to make yourself feel, understand the poor. That then leads to you realising and becoming more humble. In turn, that, hu that humility and that and being humble brings you closer to Allah. And being close to Allah keeps shaitan away from you. So it's all Correct. Like effect. Correct. It's a whole package of things that all come together all in that month which we are supposed to get closer to Allah because that's the month in which the Quran came down. Lovely. So now that we've spoken a bit about taqwa, what we can do before Ramadan, how about during Ramadan? The next question is about what to do if you can't fast during Ramadan. So who are the people that don't fast during this month and, and what should they do instead? To, to kind of participate still in the month. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very, very merciful and he has made our religion very easy for us. So fasting in the month of Ramadan is actually obligatory for only those who are young, fit and healthy. And there are so many exemptions for others. There are actually eight categories of people who do not need to fast. So two categories are completely exempt. Those are children who are under the age of puberty. 
and are still growing and need nutrients to grow. And the disabled people who are either physically disabled or mentally um, disabled, who do not understand the concept of fasting. They are completely exempt. They do not need to do anything, those two categories. Then we come on to the next category, the third category, which are the elderly. They do not need to fast because they are weak and vulnerable. Some of them may be on medication, which they need for their medical health problems, which become more rifer as they get older. What they can do is they need to feed one poor person for every fast that they skip. And that is actually in Sahih Bukhari, volume six, hadith number 4505. Then there are categories of people who do not need to fast, but can then make up for that by giving fidya money. So people who are suffering for, from any major illness or sickness, which requires medication during um, fasting hours, they have to give fidya money, okay? And fidya money is actually money which you then give to another person who is able to fast but may not have money for the suhoor or the iftar meal, the pre-dawn meal or the breaking the fast meal. So somebody poor who is able to fast but they don't have the money, you then need to give them money for two meals per day and that is called fidya money. Okay. So in a way, you are substituting by that poor person fasting for you. And then there are four categories who have to make up their fast afterwards. So the first one is the traveling person. Whoever is ill or on a journey, they do not need to observe fasts because they are also weaker when they are traveling. And they then need to make up the equivalent of those fasts afterwards at another time. That's actually in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 185. And then there is three categories, believe it or not, that are there to exempt women from fasting. One, if they are pregnant because they need uh, nutrients for the baby, they can make up those fasts afterwards. Or if they are breastfeeding, because we know that breastfeeding requires a lot of nutrients in the milk to feed the baby. Or a woman who is on her menstrual cycle as well, uh, they do not need to fast because they are also weak and vulnerable at that stage. So Allah has protected women in three different ways. Those three, they do not need to fast. However, they do need to make up an equal number of fasts afterwards. Now, within that women category, there may be some women, for example, who are pregnant. Then they go through postnatal bleeding after the pregnancy, after the birth of their babies. And then for two years, they need to then also breastfeed their babies. Two years, up to two years. And then they may decide to have another baby which then there's another cycle of another two years. In that case, then they can also give fidya money for somebody else then to keep fasts instead of them. And they can get around it that way. Oh, okay. So there's almost four, uh, a few different things you can do. Either you make up your fast, you give fidya money, or you just, uh, you're just not in a position to do anything. Um, yes, like you or you are completely exempt. If you are physically or mentally ill, and you don't know why you fast, and also if you are below the age of puberty, then you don't need to do anything. So there are a number of things that you can do there. And the elderly was you could um, feed another person, um, you know, instead, a poor person, and then there was the fidya money category as well. Okay. Lovely. So in short, there's people that just don't need to fast, they're completely exempt for children and people who may be disabled or have mental health issues, um, and they kind of can't 
understand the concept of fasting. Then there's elderly who cannot physically fast, and so they almost pay for someone else to do so, and that's known as fidya. Fidya money, that is actually to do with somebody who is ill, like diabetes, um, and they definitely cannot um, fast again, ever. You see, so then they have to give money to somebody else, and then the other four categories they need to make up their fasts. Um, and if they really can't, um, which is especially the, the women, for example, are pregnant and breastfeeding, then they can also give Vidya money as well. Lovely. Um, so that just kind of sums up what people should do instead of fasting. We've mentioned all the kind of do's and don'ts and um, a little bit of information regarding um, Ramadan. Uh, the next question is about almost what you shouldn't do or if you should do this. So the last question for today is on Shiva Bharat. So, and, and the kind of two sides to it, is it Fida, is it Ibada? Should you do it? Should you not engage in it? Um, but what would be your advice? Okay, so Shabi Bharat, and it's called Different Days in Different Cultures. It's also called Layla Bara and Shabi Bara as well. And Shabi Bharat more in the Southeast Asian subcontinent. Um, it is basically Bida, and the Bida actually comes from one ayah in the Quran, which is in Surah al Dukhan, chapter 44, verse 3, the smoke, which refers to a special night, and it's referred to as Layla de Mubaraka. And in that night, it also explains that Allah decrees our lifespan, our provisions, our fate, everything. Now that Layla de Mubaraka, a lot of scholars have interpreted that as the same night as Layla to Qadr, which comes in Ramadan. And Layla to Qadr is the same night in which Allah decrees our lifespan, he decrees our provisions, our fate, etc, etc. Most scholars agree upon is that there cannot be two nights promising the same thing. There are no two nights. It is the same night, Laylatul Qadr, which is being referred to in the Quran. Now, where the problem has arisen is where people's native language may not be Arabic, and they have misinterpreted that ayah in Surah al dukhan as a different day as Laylatul Qadr. And if you look at some of the things, the, some of the misconceptions that happen within um, this day of Shabe Brath, they are actually equivalent to some things which happen in every month or every day. So one of them is actually fasting on the night of 15th of Shaban, singling it out as a special night. Now that's a fabrication because in every 15th of every single month, we should fast because that's what the Prophet did. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to fast on the 15th of every single month. He, that is one of the nights when the night uh, has a full moon and when there is a full moon, because the tides are high, it is linked to our moods and we are more likely to do bad. This is why full moons are linked with werewolves coming out when you look at uh, horror movies. And when there is a full, full moon, it can have an effect on our moods and we are more likely to do bad because the tidal waves are very, very large when it is the full moon. And that has an effect on the water in our bodies. And then we're more likely to do bad. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to tell us to fast so that to restrain ourselves from doing bad on that night. So um, he used to do that every, every 15th of every month. It doesn't single out that month or that, uh, you know, Shaban in particular. The other misconceptions like Allah comes down in the third part of the night on the first heaven, and we should pray then and he will answer our prayers. That happens in all months. The hajjat happens every single day. 
every single day of the week at the Hajjat time, which is the third part of the night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down onto the first Jannah, the first heaven, and he answers our prayers. And that is one of the times when our du'as are most likely to be accepted. So all of those things are actually equivalent to all months. So again, that is not something that is singled out on just Shabibra. And uh, we need to understand and equate it to Laylatul Qadr, basically. And then we can't go wrong. Lovely. So that kind of just clears up the misunderstanding about singling this day out. And so in short, people have misunderstood the fact that it's been called a different name and they've thought it's a different day because it's not referred to as Laylatul Qadr in that surah. And as a result, generally normal things that Muslims believe, like um, it's Sunnah to fast on the 15th and Allah comes down every night um, during the Hajjud on the first heaven. All of that is generally what we believe, but people have only assigned it to the 15th just because of this misunderstood ayah. Well, actually, we fast every 13th, 14th, 15th, like the Prophet Sallallahu did. He, and we naturally believe that Allah comes down on the first heaven every night. But for some, for some reason, people have, maybe it's the language barrier, misunderstood and thought, nope, this is just on the 15th before Ramadan begins. But as you've so well put it, it's not right. That's not how it should be. Correct. Correct. And you will find the misconceptions have occurred mostly in the lands where Arabic is not the native tongue. Well, I think that's all the questions for today's session. Um, thank you so much for going through those with me. It's been really helpful and I've really enjoyed it. Well, I guess I'll see you in the next session and hopefully we can go through more questions then. That would be excellent. And Jazakallah khair for giving me the opportunity. No worries. Well, thank you for spending some time with going through these. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Well, I guess I'll see you in the next session.